Welcome. Good evening. I am Carolyn Ward Bamford, and on behalf of the Music Division, I am thrilled to welcome you to this evening's pre concert talk on the conservation of three paintings in the Whithall Pavilion with Arthur Page and Catherine Campbell from Page Conservation. Arthur Page is the chief conservator and co owner of Page Conservation, which is located right here in Washington, D.C., on 7th Street Northwest. The firm was established in 1982 and specializes in the conservation of easel paintings and murals. Mr. Page was born in Washington, D.C., has an undergraduate degree in art history from Chapel Hill, and a master's degree in art conservation from the Cooperstown Graduate Program. Um, interestingly enough, Mr. Page has worked um, on other um, artwork in the uh, Jefferson Building here at the Library of Congress. Um, some of the murals that you see um, when you're out in the hallway of this beautiful, beautiful building. And also, when you go into the concert, there is a painting of Mrs. Coolidge, um, Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, and her son, and he did the conservation work on that as well. And Catherine Campbell is the senior conservator at Page Conservation, and she is a graduate of the Buffalo State College Masters of Art Conservation Program. So many of you are here tonight to see and hear um, the Stradivarian instruments that were given by Gertrude Clark Whithall. And um, you, you can see them in the display cases and you can hear them on stage. The pavilion, the Whithall Pavilion, is named for her. And as you walk from the foyer down into this room, there's actually a watercolor of her on the wall. You can see what she looked like. In 1935, she donated Stradivari instruments to the Library of Congress so that they could be seen and heard by many people. In 1938, she sent a check for $30,000 to the Librarian of Congress for this room, for her sanctuary, her Stradivari sanctuary, and it's now the Whithaw Pavilion. The Whithaw Pavilion was completed, um, and within a few months, by, by 1938, um, right under $30,000 even. Um, but she delayed the opening of the pavilion so that she could hire an interior decorator to design and to put the furnishings in the room. And I don't know if many of you know that. Um, and so if you look around, you look at the ceiling, it's a coved ceiling. There's um, decorative woodwork. Um, if you've noticed before in the iron grill work, there's violins here and in this one on this side. The tapestry in back of you, the furniture in the foyer, all of that she picked out and she had for this sanctuary of hers. She also um, bought the two bronze um, um, reduction casts that you see, one here and one in the back, and then the two still lifes, the 17th, 17th century still lifes by Batera, which hang in the foyer. Later editions include musical instruments and the portrait of Beethoven in this room, and they were not from Mrs. Whithall. Um, this evening, Arthur Page and Catherine Campbell will discuss the conservation of three paintings in this room with their work addressing grime, discolored old varnish, mismatched repaint, and a desire to improve the clarity of the image. Catherine will start with the Beethoven portrait that was painted in 1815 by Heckel, it was donated by a very important American art collector, Robert Owen Lehman, in 1968. He purchased it in the 1960s, likely from the family of Heckel. The Heckel painting was commissioned by the Stryker um, piano firm. Beethoven sat for this portrait in their concert hall. This portrait was supposed to hang in their concert hall as well, and for some reason, it went through the Heckel family and remained there until the purchase in the 1960s. But it is considered the most faithful representation of Beethoven. The portrait was made from life, and Beethoven did not like sitting for portraits at all, which I think um, um, might be the reason why he always looks angry and frustrated in his later paintings. Here, he was 45 when the portrait was painted. At this time, he was socially withdrawn, he was deaf, he communicated through his conversation books. But here we clearly see Beethoven's face and his eyes were drawn to them and he looks like he's in very good health. 
And with that introduction, I will turn it over to Catherine. Thank you. And thank you folks for coming this evening to hear about the conservation of these three paintings. My name is Catherine Campbell. As Carolyn said, I am the Senior Paintings Conservator uh, at Page Conservation here in Washington, DC. So I'm gonna start us off today by explaining paintings conservation by examining the treatment of the portrait of Ludwig von Beethoven by Johann Christoph Heckel. Okay, first, what is conservation? The American Institute for the Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, our professional organization, defines conservation as the profession devoted to the preservation of cultural property for the future. As you know, cultural property can cover a wide range of categories, including buildings, statuary, ceramics, documents, um, clothing and paintings, just to name a few items. Within these categories, the items that are frequently created uh, are from different types of materials. This means that the ability to correctly analyze and identify all aspects of the artifact is crucial. Conservators today have training in chemistry, studio art, and art history. Additional training may include metallurgy, biology, entomology, and even computer science, to name just a few uh, specializations. The most common path to becoming a conservator today is to obtain a master's degree in art conservation or a related field. I have a master's degree in art conservation with a specialization in paintings conservation from Buffalo State College, which is one of three schools in the US where that specialization is available. Okay, the painting of Ludwig von Beethoven came to page conservation for treatment at the end of 2016. It is unique because, as we've heard, it was painted from life in 1915. The image that you see here is the painting before it was treated. The first step for conservation is always to examine the artifact and try to determine how the painting was created. Next, I try to determine what has happened to it over time. If the changes relate to the materials and methods of construction or outside forces. Only once the painting has been completely examined can a plan be determined to preserve the artifact for the future. Okay, so the on, uh, examination observations start from the lowest structural level and proceed up. So practically what this means is that the first step for any treatment is to remove the painting from its frame so that the tacking edges and back of the painting can be directly observed. When I look at the back of this painting, the first thing that I notice is that the painting has been treated before. I can tell this because the stretcher is not an original stretcher. It's an expansion bolt type which only came into use starting in the 1950s. Also, the original canvas is not visible. Uh, what we would expect from a painting from 1915 is for it to be an old, aged linen, which would probably be brown in color and instead of the light tone that we're seeing here. What we have is a supporting fiberglass lining canvas adhered with wax, and you can see this right around the very outside edges and um, there is a cover, cover of muslin across the back of it, which is where we're getting the lighter color, the cream uh, white color. It's not uncommon for a painting to be lined for stabilization, but it's only undertaken if the painting has a problem and a need. Anytime I see a lining, I know that I have to determine what the instability was that caused this to happen. Common causes are tears or extreme distortions of the canvas or paint. Okay, at this point in conservation, I move to the, the obverse of the painting. Many of the analytical techniques used by conservators uh, to determine the material and structure of paintings are things that we can do at home. For this, 
Useful information can be gathered by changing the way that the painting is illuminated. Normal, even lighting can be used to detect color inconsistencies, inconsistencies of details, paint abrasions, or discoloration of varnishes. For this painting, there is a dark looking area in the hair, uh, right here, <laughs> and three dark areas along the very bottom. So here. The varnish also has a thick and somewhat discolored appearance, and the painting is lacking the clarity that we would expect. Raking illumination is a single directional lighting system. It's especially useful for revealing planar distortions and flaking paint. This painting did not have any flaking paint. However, the areas that looked dark when we observed them under normal illumination do continue to also look un unexpectedly uh, dark and out of place. Obe Bleak specular illumination is another single directional uh, lighting method. This highlights the surface sheen and reveals any surface inconsistencies. This painting has a flattened texture that is characteristic of paintings that have been lined. Our four problem areas look flat relative to the surrounding surface with minimal canvas texture detectable. So if you look right here, we have the area that, that we previously identified as being problematic, as well as right here, right here, and right here. Another thing that you can see with this painting is you can see some of these lines. So these are very... Um, um, expected elements for, uh, uh, for a surface. It's um, paint texture and canvas weave. Okay, next we look at UV illumination. This is, you can buy a UV light at any pet store and look at your painting that way. It's, it's used to detect problems with your, your pets. We'll say no more. However, for paintings, it reveals color-specific fluorescence of all of the materials present. So the first thing that is revealed with the UV is that the four areas that looked unusual in the previous lighting do not fluoresce the same as the surrounding paint. So in this case, they're very dark looking. So here and there again, right down here along the bottom. This, this dark non-fluorescence is a characteristic of modern synthetics. Additionally, there is a slight green overtone to the painting that is characteristic of the presence of a natural resin. Um, the green tone is somewhat uneven, however, in appearance, which suggests that the varnish was thinned in the past. So you can see that right here, for example, it's a little greener and then also right along the very edges. It has a, a brightness to it, a brighter green appearance. Okay, now we can make some general observations based on our overall examination. There are areas with mismatched repaint, the dark areas that we've identified. The surface itself looks to have a yellow tone from discolored varnish and there is an uneven surface texture and inconsistencies in the fluorescence in the, area, in the areas that appear to be old damages. So that's the same spots that we've been looking at. Based on our overall examinations, these four detail areas in red need closer examination. In looking at the face in raking and UV illumination, we see that there are non-fluorescing dark areas in the hair and throughout the background, which correspond to areas where the paint color is slightly different from the surroundings. These areas are all modern in painting materials. The large dark triangular area in the hair is possibly a tear. So this 
triangular area and the area right underneath it appear to be consistent with tears. The thin lines are characteristic of drying paint cracks that have been inpainted. So these are what I'm referring to are all of these fine little lines that are throughout the painting in the back right here. Drying cracks occur when a non-drying material is included in the paint or when the painting layers dry at different rates. When we look at the bottom left corner, we notice that the paint surface has a crack pattern that does not extend into the area with a modern synthetic repaint. So that is this area. So you can see that right through here there are cracks. However, in this area, there are no cracks visible. So that indicates that there is a fill and an inpainting that has occurred in that area. The same observations hold true for the bottom center damage, as well as in the bottom right corner. So now that we have finished the treatment or the examination, we can determine the treatment needs. The first consideration is always to address any structural instabilities. The past treatment, however, did address this problem by lining the canvas. Cleaning of the painting, if needed, is the next step. At this point, the training in chemistry comes into play. As a conservator, my mandate is to understand the chemical properties of the original artifact. I have to know how the properties of the added material and how I know how to safely remove those materials without affecting the original. There are several cleaning issues that we identified during the examination. The main concern is that there are the four mismatched in painting uh, damages that are visually distracting. The varnish is overly thick and somewhat discolored and should be removed. The fills for the damages need to be refined to obtain a surface more consistent with the surrounding original paint film. Once the painting is cleaned, a new protective varnish layer is applied and careful in painting incurs to re reintegrate the damages with the original paint film. Treatment, as expected, is always a very slow and careful process. So when the painting starts to have the varnishes and re, re, uh, repaint removed, result in the painting looking significantly worse as these old damages are revealed. So what you see here is the, um, the discolored varnish and repaint has been removed from the left side of the image. So this, this side has all of the top layer of varnish and repaint removed from it. So we're seeing the painting as it actually exists in its original state. So what you see there is the artist's hand. When you compare the normal and the UV illumination images, you can see a change in the fluorescence as the added materials are removed. So what you're seeing here is there is a slightly bluish appearance to this surface. It's really the old varnish was just covering a lower layer. <coughs> okay. Cleaning the face reveals the fine crack pattern in the background. One interesting thing that is revealed is that there are two campaigns of filling and repaint present. The white material right here and right here um, is a later fill material that is applied over a toned fill or repaint material that is revealing itself as the remaining darker area still on the piece. I've removed the materials that are soluble in the chemical xylene, but there is still dark material present in the hair. This tells me that the painting has been damaged and worked on at least twice. Cleaning the varnish and repaint from the damages along the bottom center 
reveals damages that have also had the white fill material from the more recent treatment. All of the modern repaint materials, which were soluble in xylene, have been removed at this point in these images. What is now revealed are the remnants of another older green fluorescing varnish. That would be these elements right here and here, and then also right up in the long in here. Further testing was undertaken to determine if the residues can and should be reduced. The residues were found to be a natural resin varnish that was safely soluble in acetone solutions. The varnish was discolored and had noticeably, uh, was noticeably changing the color tone in the black passages. Removal of the discolored varnish and small areas of older repaint residues was undertaken. Removal is most detectable on the UV image. The far left side of the coat has been cleaned. So you can see right here, this area has had the residues removed and this area is still waiting to have the, uh, the old residues removed from it. Okay, magnification is a very useful tool for the conservator. Many of the details we work with are very fine in nature and an exact understanding of what is happening at all stages of the process is crucial. Often the changes are subtle in nature, and the microscope can help with seeing the differences. In this image, the discolored varnish and repaint residues are masking the darker paint of black uh, of the, the paint surface, and it gives it a brown tone. So what I'm referring to is visible right here. You can see a clearer black in this cleaned area. So right in this area, it's a much blacker uh, appearance as compared to this area where the, uh, the coat has taken on more of a brown tone. Okay, the old fills and repaint in the hair were reduced mechanically with a scalpel also under magnification. What I found was that a significant portion of the original undamaged paint was covered with this fill material. The reason for this was the mended damage created an indentation on the surface and the fill was an attempt to level the surface. Without reversing the lining, this old mend cannot be made flat and that is not something that is appropriate at this time as the lining is in good shape. As a conservator, my first goal is to reveal as much of the original paint as possible. Since Beethoven was known for his hairstyle, Revealing more of his original hair was especially gratifying. Now that the painting has been cleaned to the extent safely possible of all added materials, it's time to examine the cleaned painting and make a plan for the in-painting. In-painting is used to compensate for the losses and allow for the viewer to understand the artist's vision for their work. As a conservator, my goal is to use the minimum amount of material on areas of loss to gain the maximum effect. In painting only occurs on areas of damages. Conservators do not use the type of paint that the artist would have originally used. We instead have paints that are specifically created to be chemically stable and reversible in known solvents so that they can be removed in the future if need be with no damage to the surrounding original paint. As you can see in this image, the paintbrushes we use are extremely small. So this is a number zero brush that we use. Um, we work under magnification and use small dots of color to knit the damages together. The paints are applied in a water-like consistency and many passes are required to get the correct color volume. 
This is what the painting looked like with all of the non-original materials removed and a varnish applied. The tears require in-painting, as do old solvent abrasion areas in the background. What I'm referring to are these areas right here, the solvent abrasions and all of our tear, filled tear areas. This is the painting after treatment. Okay, you can see here that all of the non-fluorescing materials in the hair have been removed and more original paint is visible. The drying cracks are also more noticeable. One of the things that you also notice in the UV shot is that the, uh, the paint has very specific fluorescence. So here we have a nice pink cheeks that are pinker really looking than what you see in normal illumination and that is characteristic of a rose matter uh, paint. Okay, and this is the painting after treatment. Okay, here all of the old non-fluorescing materials um, have been removed again. And one of the interesting things that was revealed by the removal of the old repaint and varnish along the bottom edge was that the actual, actual tear damage was smaller than it originally appeared. The paint around the tears, however, is somewhat damaged through abrasions. Okay. And here is the end result for the painting after the treatment. And just as a recap, this is what our portrait of Ludwig von Beethoven looks like under normal illumination after it was treated. And I recommend that everyone takes a closer look at it at the end of the, uh, the, the talk period. And thank you, and I will answer questions at the second half of the talk. I'm going to give the, uh, the area over to Carolyn again. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Catherine. That was fascinating. And please, as you go into the um, concert, into the auditorium, take a look at Beethoven. Um, now, Arthur Page will discuss the Batera still lifes that were done in the 17th century and which hang in the foyer. So when you first came into the room, you saw into the foyer, you saw the two paintings there. They were purchased by Mrs. Whithall in 1949. Um, and Batera was Italian, um, well known for still lifes with musical instruments in them. And also, um, a lot of these still lifes depict the immortality of art and music in his paintings, and often have a carpet or a tapestry in there. So when you look at them, you'll see some roughness that, that is in the tapestry, and, and maybe afterward you can go back and look at those um, right now. They're very common features. Um, the conservation with these paintings in particular, um, also addressing the old varnish, and a desire to improve the clarity of image um, revealed many things um, to me, uh, including many musical instruments that I hadn't seen. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm going to hand it over to Arthur now. OK, thank you. Um, and I hope everybody can see these well enough, and fortunately on the way out you can take a look, and certainly also look at Beethoven, who's, you know, a little taller in real life over here. Okay, now we're going to turn to these two large still lifes of musical instruments by the Bergamese master, Bartolomeo Batera. These paintings are of a particular type, painted by Batera and his mentor, Evarista Bachinas. The two paintings share these two paintings share the same materials and past restoration history, but there are some unusual differences, as we'll see. Uh, I'll alternate between the two paintings to tell the story, but we've labeled uh, each slide so you can know which painting you're looking at because it gets very confusing. Uh, now, both paintings have been cleaned and lined in the past, and you're getting some idea what that's about. Um, 
This means the original canvas was backed with a second canvas or lining canvas for additional support. This is a much more normal, uh, old-fashioned type of lining. So this, this, this linen, original linen canvas has a, another linen glued to the back. And um, what happens is paintings are often torn, of course, or they simply tear off the stretcher at the edges where the, the fabric is folded around the acidic wood and it just basically rots off. So linings on old paintings are fairly common. Uh, here's the second painting. Uh, when we're looking at these, um, you, let's see, I'm going to get this little pointer going here. This is the identifier. This is a pile of coins in the center. That's the only way I can keep these, these straight. Um, now, the, the, I, I think I just said the wood stretchers are fairly new. They're traditional style. Catherine had expansion bowl stretchers, which were somebody's great idea in the 50s and 60s. We used them up until relatively recently, and now basically we, along with a lot of other people, are going back to the old stretchers with the wood keys because they actually work better because you can move one bar and not both bars at the same time. Small but uh, important feature. Okay, now, uh, why would we work on these paintings now? Uh, they've been restored at least three or four times in the past. Uh, these paintings are older than, than Catherine's painting uh, by quite a bit. Um, now, the thing to remember here is that conservation or restoration work uh, is always designed to be redone uh, over time uh, as the varnishes, the linings, the other restoration materials sort of outlive their, their uh, useful lifespan. What, and so what's happened to these paintings is that the surfaces have become darkened and obfuscated by atmospheric grime, same as Catherine's painting, and discolored yellow varnish. Um, our field conservation didn't manage to invent or adopt a, a varnish that didn't turn yellow until the 1950s. So almost all the paintings we look at that were conserved some time ago have, have got a yellow varnish. Now, um, you guys are experts on UV light now, so uh, various areas were repainted on these paintings. And it was done, as with Catherine's painting, too broadly uh, or too heavily for current museum standards. So remembering what we just learned on that, we can, see some, we can see some things here. We see a fluorescing varnish layer. My varnish layers here are a little, uh, oh my, let me, uh, let me get back where I want to go. Let me get back where we are, okay. Um, all right, get my pointer thing going here. I wanted to show you, wow. Okay, I wanted to show you this edge, which has a, a nice, uh, um, hang on guys. I got my little pointer going the, now I'm going the right way here. We'll, we'll look, take a look at this edge, which is repainted here. Um, notice down here the heavy repaint on all the drapes and things. So this is stuff that you've seen from Catherine's. Now this is something new. This is kind of neat. Uh, Carol Lynn was making a little reference to this. Uh, what the artist did is he actually impressed uh, texture into the paint. And the way they do this is um, he creates a kind of a thick plastic paint layer and he takes tools and different things and impresses texture uh, and tools it before the uh, paint is dried. And this is a, a better shot, gives you a close up of what he did. There's little creases and lines, little dots. Uh, it doesn't need to be perfect. Uh, we, we couldn't find a repeating pattern of a roller or anything like that, uh, but it works pretty well. And so that's very visible out here and on the paintings, and you may want to take a look on your way out. Now, Batera used the globe motif in many of his paintings. Carol Lynn was kind of referring to this. He's, he's trying to make a little statement. And, drag these different things in. Um, it's always interesting to look at a globe in an old painting. It tells you what was known or discovered or believed about uh, the world at the time the painting was painted. Uh, in this case, uh, we have some grime and varnish that are hiding some details. Uh, in the other painting, he used an astrological globe that was more colorful and... Uh... Okay, so now we're going to start the cleaning. 
Um, we'll do the same thing that Catherine did. We're going to sort of unpack the surface. That's conservators like to say that. It's sort of unpack it layer by layer. So we're going to start up top and remove uh, surface soot and grime uh, with an aqueous agent, uh, a chelating agent. Uh, we have a nice neutral pH. We put it on with swabs. Uh, we, we get the grime off. Uh, we then use a distilled water on a swab to rinse it and dry the surface. And so what you're looking at here uh, on the right side is, is where we have cleaned, and it, it just looks a little frosty there because we, when you clean it, you know, you have just a little bit of a, uh, a cleaning residue there. Okay, now, assume we finished the grime cleaning. We're going to do sort of what Catherine did. We're going to come back across, and we're going to take some varnishes and repaints off. So what we're doing here on the right side is we're going to take the varnish off. We went across it first. We had to go across these paints two times to get different things up. First time across with a naphtha and acetone mix, and we got the upper varnish layer off. Her, her, she had a synthetic varnish that came off in xylene. We have a natural resin varnish or a resin oil varnish that comes off in naphtha and acetone. But as with her painting, we could tell there was more, more uh, materials on there. So we went back across a second time with xylene, ethanol, and water. And you go, hmm, wonder why they mixed water in there. What we're trying to do is the older varnish layer underneath had a nice layer of grime on it. So by kicking in a little bit of water, we're able to get that, get that loosened up. So our second cleaning mix took off the rest of the varnish and most of the repaint. So this is kind of a little different than hers, but, but the, same, the same idea. And, uh, and uh, yes, we roll a lot of swabs. I mean, it takes, it takes you a thousand swabs or something to clean this painting. Um, now, uh, if I can make my little pointer go where I want to, notice this side over here, all up and down. Boy, I'm really not good at this. All up and down is um, a little two-inch strip that was uh, added to the side of the painting to make it bigger. And they, and they painted it in. And yes, when we got to the other side, we found another two-inch strip over there. So now here's, here's the half-cleaned UV shot, a little more straightforward than Catherine's because most of the varnish on this one sort of came off. Um, the little hole, the little round uh, circular spots on the left side are uh, our cleaning tests where we're trying to figure out what kind of solutions are going to work on different areas and what's repainted and what's not. So that, that's what they're about. Okay. So, now, this is the fully cleaned, this is one of the paintings, fully cleaned after we've put a new varnish on the surface to saturate the image. Because when you, you know, when you clean it, it's sort of dull and you need to get a varnish back on to saturate. Now, I want to say that all three paintings, hers and these two, we, we didn't take all of the repaint off. Uh, that's sometimes a little too risky. The older restorers didn't obey the current sort of conservation rules where you, you're supposed to use reversible repaint or in-painting medium. Uh, they just used oil paint to uh, repaint damages to paintings. So after enough years, the oil repaint will have the same solubility as the oil original. And then life gets really interesting. So some of this stuff we just don't take off because it's, it's not worth it. It's too risky. Okay, so here are two paintings, um, fully cleaned and varnished. Now, there's different kinds of varnish you put on paintings. Um, we used a small molecule traditional varnish uh, to get a saturated look to the, uh, to the paintings. Um, and over here, if I can make this thing work. Wow. Hang on, guys. I'm really hating this. It's going back. I'm, I'm trying to point with this thing, and it's rolling the other way around. So uh, let me just, sorry. Left edge added, and I didn't want to do that. Uh, my apologies. Left edge added, some fills in the center. Right edge added, and then you notice at the bottom of the right edge, we took the repaint off down there. We, we, took re, we took heavy layers of repaint off both edges. We left the lower marst uh, repaint simply because it was some, something to be a base for our end painting. But that lower right corner was so bad 
that we just took it all off. We didn't even think we could uh, in paint over it. Now the other painting, the coins painting, just basically was bigger. And so I think it's as simple as they took the, the violin and globe and just made it bigger so it would be symmetrical with the coins painting. Um, okay. And uh, this is maybe beating it to death here, but you know these, these two strips were, were added. Okay, now, um, we made some reference to this texture stuff, and we had lots of places on this painting where the texture, uh, there had been old fills put in, and the texture wasn't right, or in the case of that lower right edge, there wasn't any texture out there, so I had to put some in. So what we came up with was to take basically a dental burr on your flexible shaft tool and you could make the indentations perfectly because I'm putting them into a rock hard old surface and uh, the artist had the benefit of doing it when everything was wet. So but anyway, with a, with a dental tool, we put them in very nicely. Okay, so now we're at the point and these are two different, these are two other paintings. These are not our paintings. We're now at the point of in-painting or reinstating losses and abrasions. Usually what you do is you in-paint what's missing by looking at what's around it, kind of hook it up, and it tells you what to do. Uh, in this case, with this artist, we could also magically pull up uh, several other Batera paintings off the internet. And so the artist seems to have used the same set of props and instruments for most of his paintings. So I, it was kind of funny when this occurred to me. I mean, he would be absolutely flabbergasted, I think, today to see all of his paintings lined up with the same props, you know, on Google Images or something. It would be, he, would, he would go crazy. Um, so these paintings in particular have, of course, maybe it's not even worth using the pointer, have our exact same globe, uh, very similar draperies, uh, lots of the instruments are shared. Uh, this motif up here of the drape sort of hanging across the top. So it's, it's very, uh, very interesting, the commonalities we found. And so we use that to, to, to help us. Okay, now we're back to one of our paintings. We had three specific areas on this one we wanted to look at. Uh, obviously the globe, uh, it was abraded and had some writing on it that we weren't sure was old writing, and we were a little, little questioning that. Uh, the center, uh, what's going on there is where the, where, the, where the one instrument lays over the back of the other instrument, it's an area that's damaged and we could not tell what was going on and those are not instruments that we were familiar with. And then in the right there, you'll see there's some odd things going on. There's some repaint or possibly what you would call pentimento, which is a fancy word for an artist change that is now showing through. So let's, let's go on in there and take a look. Okay, on the globe, our question was, did the globe really say, you know, America? And that was an interesting question. Um, or was this title kind of a, you know, 20th century sales pitch to um, <laughs> sell to a rich American buyer, you know? And we were kind of concerned about that. Well, sure enough, we found America on that globe on another Batera painting. And so we just in-painted the abrasions and different things and hooked the lines up and stuff like that. And, and we felt good that we probably weren't perpetuating a hoax of any sort. So it's, uh, and also it is neat to find a 17th century painting with America on it. That's, you know, that's pretty unusual as near as I can tell. Um, okay, now up here, a little clearer shot what's going on or not going on up there. The little white fills are specific little losses that we had. What's going on is that, is that there were some older, sort of more confusing losses in there, and it just was not clear what was going on with that instrument. So, but, you know, go look at one of his other paintings, and then you can see how it's supposed to lay and all that. So this is after in painting, um, and we were able to put it back together. It wasn't real complicated, but boy, we couldn't, we were having a hard time. We had Carol Lynn come over, and we all kind of scratched our heads for a while, and then Fortunately, found a found a nice uh, found a nice image. Okay, now this this little corner over here was kind of crazy. Um, there's three things going on. There's a nice strong curved line, and then uh, there's a horizontal line right at this level, and then there's this funny tree shape thing here. 
Um, and so if I can make my pointer just get out of the way here. Um, we want to know what those things were and, and what was really supposed to be there. So uh, this is after we've in painted, and, and it w the answers were relatively straightforward, in, I think, in the end. The, uh, the heavy curved line we found on some other paintings, and he just used um, cords, you know, drape, to hold his drapes up, because they sort of float in and out of his paintings, so he, had, he used cords to sort of hold them up. Now the horizontal line, that's a grid layout line from when he created the painting. So he drew a grid and then painted the painting in. And uh, sometimes the artists leave them intentionally, sometimes they sort of show up over time, and we almost always leave them in place because they're really kind of a neat thing about how the piece is done. And then the little, the little tree thing in this area here. Um, oh, I really hate that guy, sorry. <coughs> little tree thing. Um, what I think it was is either uh, old uh, in painting or something, but it was totally insoluble. And so you had a relatively easy solution of just paint it out. But what we do on these kind of things is you made, we didn't make it completely disappear. Believe me, if we wanted that to disappear, it would disappear. So we left it just showing a little bit because it was kind of an interesting little remnant. But, but I didn't want it to be so obtrusive that it would be an element in the painting which really shouldn't, shouldn't you know, be there. Okay, now we can go here. Um, the, um, and we got after treatment on the left. Um, and in this photo, I'm hoping in the photo, you can see that it is lighter, clearer, cleaner, a little more readable. That certainly was the, the effect that happened in real life. Um, and we decided, talking to Carol Lynn here, that um, we would stay with the enlarged size. And so on the right and left, we have essentially just run the composition out to the edges. And I think that was perfectly uh, defensible type of thing. Um, and on this one, um, again, after treatment on the left, um, we, have a, we certainly have a clearer image. Um, our in painting was on the various uh, areas that we talked about, you know, where those instruments came together. You may remember the drapery at the top had some big losses, and uh, it was fairly conventional in painting on this. Um, now, an important thing is, as with Catherine's painting, what we could put back on with in painting was a fraction of the size of what we took off, and about, you know, 100 times less thick. Um, and so this is where we sort of end up. I wanted to mention that when we do these things at our studio, it's kind of a collaborative effort. Catherine did basically the work on, on uh, Beethoven. On this particular set, uh, Peter Nelson and Christy Romano cleaned the paintings. Um, I did texture and varnishing. I do a lot, most of the varnishing. And Marion Colomer did the in-painting. So it's kind of a you know, team effort over here. And um, that's, that's what we have for you. And we want to thank the Library of Congress because it was a nice contract to work on these things and we enjoyed it. It was much more interesting than most, most things we get. And then Carol Lynn was very nice to work with and David was very nice today to make sure we got in here and got set up properly. So I think that's what we have for you. If you have any questions, if you could just uh, raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you so that we can Record it. Thank you so much. Uh, and obviously <laughs> begs the question uh, of the timely Leonardo da Vinci, the half billion dollar <laughs> painting that some Saudi bought, which I can't believe is crazy. But with all this that you're talking about with the in painting and such, how can they have verified that that painting was original? I mean, do you know anything about that? I've not, I've not read up on it extensively, but I know that they were studying that painting for about 20 years or something. Um, and one of the, so on, a, on an old master painting, th there aren't many Leonardo's. This is a big deal. And I think he got it cheap at, you know, half a billion dollars in my opinion. Seriously, I think he got it cheap because there'll never be another one sold. Think about that for a minute, okay? Unless he sells this one again, but anyway. Okay, so what do you do? You would, you would look at the characteristic palette 
to the extent you can get uh, pigments or anything off of a Leonardo, right? Because they just don't let you go sample them, you know. But there would be uh, uh, major conservation departments all around the world who would have some idea of the palette that he used. So what kind of, you know, red and, and which white and uh, what was his mix of paints? And you can do that through sampling and you can also do that uh, with... Uh, a variety of non-destructive yeah, uh, and destructive um, X-ray fluorescence is not, it's not destructive. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's all kinds of information that may be in conservation departments around the world that they would compare this thing to and see if it fits. Because this is what you do when you're trying to nail one of these things down. You, you, never, you never get, at the end, somebody hands you something and says, this is, it's always the other way around. It's like, we don't see any reason this couldn't be. Okay, that's what, that's what our kind of stuff usually is. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes you will get, they studied uh, uh, Rembrandt to the point that his palette is, is really well known and you can just do some analysis on a Rembrandt and if it doesn't fall in a certain pattern, mm -hmm. you know you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. So this has been done, this is not unique to Leonardo, but, mm -hmm. but you take anything that people like us can cook up and you'd add uh, uh, curatorial input and the history of where the thing's been, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, add it up. Mm -hmm. And apparently, you know, enough people buy into it that bidding went crazy. Mm -hmm. And that man, that man never bought another serious painting before. Mm -hmm. So, did, I, did and, I give him any well, further and on that? All of the examination techniques that we discussed today, with ones that are a little more um, involved, um, would end up playing into the direction for the conservation treatment as well. So you'd look and, and determine what was original materials, what was not original. You do the stewardship, you, you do curatorial um, you know, insights into what is typical of brush strokes, and you use all of that information to direct the conservation treatment once you know exactly what you have for the, the original, which is left. So it's, it's just a, um, as far as the conservation is concerned, a much more involved um, treatment above what you saw for these paintings. It just takes quite a bit more time and very powerful microscopes. And Leonardo, you've got, you've got to have wood of the correct age, you've got to have the correct wood. You know, you're going to look at all that kind of stuff because there's been many a fake panel painting given away. They're, they would be smart enough to use an old piece of wood, but there was a famous one mm -hmm. that uh, they filled the wormhole, they used an old piece of furniture, filled the wormholes, and as soon as they x-rayed the painting, they saw the wormholes were filled, which it would not have been because uh, if the painting was put on a new panel, there wouldn't have been any wormholes. <laughs> and uh, so that was a famous case at Cleveland some years ago. But uh, that's great. It's a, anyway, sorry. Uh, what is the rarest uh, piece that you have worked on? Uh, and <clears throat> how long did this effort take you? And does the restoration increase the values of the paintings? Or does it maintain their values, or how, how do you how do you judge that, or do you even judge it if you just if that's what you're set out and contracted to do? Well, we, let me go at that a little bit backwards. Um, um, well, actually, I'm going go at it whichever way I can think of it here. Okay, um, conservators don't like to name drop that much, but. You know, we've, we've had some nice things in. We've, we've been able to do all the presidents, pretty much. And, uh, uh, and there's three, three, life, three portraits of uh, Jackson, for example. We've done all of those. And stuff, stuff like that. So we, we, because you're in Washington, D.C., you know, and you work for these institutions, you get, you get a lot of that kind of stuff, which is fun. And, so, and sometimes they have other paintings that are neat. They're Cezanne paintings at the White House. They're kind of fun. And, uh, but the, the, some of the neatest mm -hmm. stuff, something like this painting, I mean, pretty cool, mm -hmm. pretty cool. I used to get death threats over a Shakespeare portrait because there's a lot of conspiracy folks with that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I won't say what institution in DC might have one of those, you know, but, <laughs> but we actually got death threats. Um, I don't know, can you address some of the other parts of that question? Uh, um, 
let's see. What? What else was oh, it? The Does it increase the value of the paintings? Oh, the, and how long did these take you to do? We can answer those, okay. Okay. Um, as far as increasing the value or decreasing, we as conservers do not actually, we're not supposed to, to address any sort of um, appraisal sort of aspects for a piece. Um, it's part of our professional organization. They, they're very um, strongly motivated to not have us have conflict of interest. Um, so that's something that we don't really look at. However, the way that you can look at this is if you have a painting that has a tear on it, it is not structurally sound, and it looks horrible on your wall. So no, no one probably is going to be the slightest bit interested in purchasing it from you. So if your goal is to sell the piece, assuming that you don't have a person who really wants to buy a painting by that artist that's damaged in its original state, then you are better off getting it stabilized and having conservation. Uh, occur because it will reintegrate the, uh, you know, the, the lost areas and it will make the piece appear whole. Um, so do you have any yeah, thoughts I can, on that? Yeah, I can get sort of directly on the value thing. The most valuable painting is going to be one that's in original condition and very good condition and never been touched. However, they don't generally float around and conservators just don't we like people to just pay us because we're nice people, but generally they bring you a painting that has some difficulties and you work on it. Certainly doing good conservation with the proper materials carefully, conservatively, can help the value of a painting. If it's got a tear or something like that, it's definitely worth more uh, in the marketplace or to the viewer uh, after, after it's treated. Conversely, I think that really bad conservation with the big brush and the oil paint and the, all that kind of stuff, I, that can really hurt value. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We've we've seen cases of things that are going to be sold, and they come in with atrocious problems. And 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 sometimes we, when we conserve them, they 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 do bring a, a much more significant value. So, and then th these things here, um, let's see. Uh, Catherine's painting was a, a smaller standard size portrait, albeit a famous sitter and all that. Um, Hours, I don't know, uh, 80, 100 hours, something like that. Something I don't know. You know. I, don't, I don't actually recall. Yeah. Um, um, and then, of course, what we gave them as an estimate of what it took, because sometimes it, they're way off. These, we work very hard on these paintings. The two big ones, that's a, those things are they're outside. They're huge. Um, they could, they were, they each one of those was more than, than uh, Beethoven because of size and just another set of problems. So you got a couple hundred hours in those. I can do one more quick question. I know I saw some hands up here. You talked about uh, the obvious fact that the condition of a painting is your starting point for making your conservation decisions. I just wondered if you have any examples of where knowing in great detail the provenance of a painting, the history of ownership, and so on, would uh, be useful when you come to evaluating the conservation needs. Do you have examples of that or not? Well, you think of something. I'll start with one. Okay. Okay. After 9-11, it was real important to know that we had a portrait of Eisenhower, to know that all the dust on the back and all that was from the blast. And that was a rare case where we left it all. So you could exclude, you could exclude so the it, it, previous. It, 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 it was a big point in our treatment decision that everyone made to, like, leave that on there, because normally we would have cleaned it off. Um, and sometimes you'll know things about artists that you've worked on before, other colleagues have worked on, or something that pops up in the literature, and you know that he liked varnish or didn't like varnish, or that he used a certain paint. A lot of your modern paintings, because we work on paintings of all ages, a lot of your modern paintings, it's really helpful to know what some of these guys were up to. And it definitely influences your treatment decisions. Um, one example that... Um this is going back to an example that actually came from a, a friend. Um, one of my friends is, is a paper conservator, 
and one of the pieces that came through uh, had absolutely atrocious looking pink craft paper that was stuck to the back of it. And it was showing through, it was acidic, it was not something that you would normally want to have on, um, on a document. And in this case, it was something that did need to be left on it because that designated it as being part of the, um, the original collection of the artist. All of the, the images, you know, the, the documents um, that, that this, in, this one collection um, retained had this pink craft paper on because it was put into a, um, you know, a scrapbook. So at the point when this person passed away and they were taking everything out and selling the collection, everything that had the pink paper on the back was worth significantly more. So you would not want to remove that at all. <laughs> so at this point, we're out of time. I'm very sorry. But if we could thank again our speakers, Arthur Page and Catherine Campbell. <laughs>